NVIDIA's new mid-range GeForce Ampere graphics card is here. The RTX 3060 Ti is the fourth graphics card that will be joining the RTX 30 series, but is it the ultimate mid-range graphics card that PC gamers have been waiting for? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the MSI RTX 3060 Ti Gaming X Trio. I want to give MSI Canada a huge shout out for providing me with this review sample and so that I could bring you guys this day one coverage of Nvidia's new mid-range graphics card. Now just to be clear, even though MSI sent me this card, all of my opinions and statements I make in this review will be mine and mine alone. With that said, this will be a full on in-depth review of the card and its performance in various games and applications. This is the fourth Ampere based GeForce graphics card to be introduced by Nvidia into the RTX 30 series, but it's actually the first TI model we've seen in the lineup. That's definitely intriguing as we've never seen a TI model come out before a non-TI variant. Usually the non-TI GPU comes out first and then a few months down the road, whether it's time for a refresh or a retaliation of sorts, Nvidia will introduce a Super or TI variant of a GPU from their lineup. Which makes this GPU all the more interesting. I wonder what could have prompted Nvidia into making that decision, and makes me wonder why the 3060 didn't come out first, but I digress. Now the RTX 3060 Ti will be hitting store shelves tomorrow. This card will be targeting the mid-range market, a category that's usually one of the more popular segments, as graphics cards in this segment tend to bring great bang for the buck performance and often provide performance seen from previous flagship GPUs at much lower prices. And that's key because while flagship GPUs RTX 3090s and 3080s of the like might get a lot of attention in the tech press. Those aren't the cards that the masses are looking to buy. It's cards like the 3060 Ti that most buyers will flock towards as they don't necessarily break the bank. In this review, we'll be validating all that and seeing if this GPU is truly worth your hard earned cash. With an MSRP of $399, US it definitely does seem like an enticing option. But speaking of prices and availability, we'll be talking more about that in detail after we've gone through all the benchmarks mark results so without further ado let's get on with the review. To start off we'll be looking at the aesthetics and the design of the card. In regards to aesthetics I won't have much to say because right off the bat you might have noticed this card looks identical to the RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio that I reviewed last month. It's got the same black and grey gunmetal plastic shroud with many angular portions to it which gives it that nice aggressive and dynamic look. It's also sporting the same Trifrozer 2 design using three Torx 4.0 double ball bearing fans which by the way perform very well under load as you'll see later on. The RGB implementation is the exact same with the stripes on the front of the card and the RGB LED strip on the top along with the GeForce RTX nameplate. It looks good and makes the card attractive. On the back of the card we have the same black graphene based backplate. MSI claimed that the graphene material used here for the backplate helps with thermals and is better than a traditional plastic backplate. MSI say that the graphene composite is four times stronger than its previous plastic backplate plates and offers much higher up to 20 times the heat dissipation. To me it seems like it's more of a mixture of graphite and plastic with the backplate being mostly plastic. As much as I would have liked to see a metal backplate, hey, if it can make it advantageous for the card's thermals, I'm all for it. One of the things that MSI did change with the cooler's design was the fact that now the backplate has these cutouts near the end of the card, which I believe are meant to help with ventilation and benefit the airflow of the cooler. As the air gets drawn from the fans and is pushed throughout the entire cooler and can freely pass through from the sides and from the back. The RTX 3080 didn't have this implemented with its backplate, so I'm happy to see that MSI has improved the design. The shroud, like I mentioned earlier, is mostly made out of plastic, but doesn't feel cheap in any way. In fact, most of the build quality is quite robust, and the card overall is sturdy. The materials used here are fairly high quality and give it a nice finish as I had seen from the RTX 3080. And just like the RTX 3080, the 3060 Ti Gaming X Trio is also a pretty bulky card, which I was surprised to see. It's 323mm long, 140mm wide, and 56mm in terms of thickness. The exact same dimensions as the RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio. It's almost like MSI basically took the same heatsink and shroud and slapped it onto the 3060 Ti, which isn't a bad thing, don't get me wrong, as I was already pretty impressed with the 3080. 
1980s performance, so it's a familiar implementation, and I can appreciate that because, you know, why try to fix something that isn't broken? But since it's a bulky GPU, be mindful of its dimensions, take note of the space that's available in your case before purchasing the card. Doing a teardown of the graphics card gives us a much closer look at the heatsink's design, the cooling solution, and lets us see the components MSI is using on the card itself. Taking a look at the aluminum heatsink, you can just see how bulky it actually is. Complemented with this dense fin stack, which therefore increases surface area for greater heat dissipation and allows the card to be cooled more effectively. You can also see the six nickel plated copper heat pipes which run through the entire length of the graphics card, which are converged together and make direct contact with the GPU. These six copper heat pipes are essentially doing most of the heavy lifting, taking heat away from the GPU core, which then run throughout the cooler and then are cooled off by the air that's pushed from the fans. The RTX 3080 had seven copper heat pipes with a thicker one in the middle, as that GPU definitely needed the additional cooling, so that's one of the changes MSI made for the 3060 Ti, but you'll see that it's not problematic in any way. The other thing I wanted to point out was that MSI is using some fairly thick thermal pads which are placed on top of components such as memory modules, power delivery, and VRM heatsinks. Taking a look at the card's PCB shows us that MSI is using an 8-phase VRM for the GPU, which is controlled by an OnSemi NCP81610 controller, which is an 8-phase PWM controller. The VRMs themselves consist of OnSemi's 302045 chips that are rated for average currents of up to 45 amps and are capable of peak currents of up to 75 amps. MSI is also utilizing a 2-phase VRM design for the memory, and the MOSFETs used here are from Nyko Semi's PB616BA rated for up to 50 amps and these are controlled by a UPI US5650Q controller. Taking a look at the memory configuration itself we can see 8 Samsung GDDR6 modules surrounding the GA104 GPU die. So overall, in regards to the aesthetics and design of the GPU, MSI have done a pretty good job here. I was already pretty impressed and happy with the cooler from the 3080 Gaming X Trio, and so I was glad to see it carried over to the mid-range graphics card. I really like the look of the graphics card, the RGB implementation is on point, the cooler performs very well and is very quiet under load. MSI gets a thumbs up from me for continuing the use of this effective design. Let's move on to the specifications of MSI's RTX 3060 Ti Gaming X Trio. The 3060 Ti is powered by NVIDIA's Ampere architecture. Now if you guys want to know more about the changes they brought with Ampere, I highly recommend reading their white paper, and I have covered some of that information in my previous videos. The RTX 3060 Ti is based on the GA104 chip, manufactured on Samsung's 8 nanometer process, and has a die size of 392 millimeter square. For mid-range graphics card, that's a fairly large GPU. The GPU is packing 4,800 164 CUDA cores with a SM count of 38, 152 texture mapping units, and 80 render output units. The RTX 3060 Ti also has dedicated ray tracing hardware, where it comes with 38 second gen RT cores and also has 152 third gen tensor cores which are used for features such as DLSS. This model also has a base clock of 1410 MHz and a boost clock of 1830 MHz. In terms of memory, the card comes with 8GB of GDDR6 that runs at a speed of 14 gigabits per second, sporting a 200 256 bit memory bus. As for the IO, the card comes with three display ports, which are of the 1.4A standard, and one HDMI 2.1 port. MSI's RTX 3060 Ti Gaming X Trio has two 8 pin power connectors, and this GPU has a 200 watt TDP, which for a mid range card is a bit on the higher side, though it seems like the entire stack of Ampere based GPUs have trended towards the higher end of the power consumption spectrum, so can't say this wasn't expected. Graphics cards are just becoming more power hungry as both AMD and NVIDIA. Video are looking to push the silicon to its limits and you can actually see what I mean by this later on when we take a look at overclocking and power usage. Moving forward, let's do a quick rundown of the test system I will be using to test the RTX 3060 Ti. For the CPU, we've got an AMD Ryzen 7 3800 XT, cooled by a Corsair H115i Pro XT 280mm all-in-one liquid cooler. For the RAM, we've got 16GB of G-Skill Trident Z memory, running at 3600MHz with CL15 timings. The motherboard is an MSI MEG X570 Unify. For our storage device, we've got a 2TB Samsung 970 EVO Plus NVMe SSD. Powering the entire system is an EVGA G3 1000 watt 80 plus gold power supply. If you're interested in full system specs, check the video description down below. 
Now that we've gotten specifications for the GPU and test system out of the way, it's time we finally jumped into the performance data and benchmarks. Now for these benchmarks, I will be comparing the 3060Ti to the RTX 3080 and RTX 2080 Super. This will allow us to see how the mid-range Ampere GPU does against Nvidia's self-proclaimed flagship GPU in the same generation, and also allows us to see if it's faster than a previous generation high-end GPU. To begin with, what I wanted to first go over was the frequency behavior of MSI's RTX 3060 Ti Gaming X Trio and how it performs out of the box. For this test, Hitman 2 was used with gameplay for about half an hour, so that will allow us to see what kind of load frequency behavior the cards would exhibit under a real-world scenario, and allows us to validate advertised specs. At stock, the 3060 Ti maintains an average boost frequency of around 1944 megahertz, so that is considerably higher than what MSI officially advertises for this card. About 100 megahertz higher, so we know that the NVIDIA GPU boost is working correctly and the GPU is taking advantage of the higher headroom available. On the graph, you guys can note the behavior and see that at stock, the card is boosting often and sustaining a boost of around 1960 to 1980 megahertz, which is pretty good. Ignore those dips, those only occur during scene changes. Now when we overclock the card, we see a drastic change in terms of the boost frequency. For my overclock settings, I was able to manage a 150 megahertz offset for the core and plus 1000 megahertz for the memory and MSI afterburner. With the OC settings applied, we now see the card maintain an average boost frequency of just under 2100 megahertz at 2092 megahertz, where on the graph you guys can see the card boosting above 2100 megahertz often and sustaining around 2130 to 2145 megahertz, which is excellent. And I was pretty happy to see those boost figures because that is quite high. And usually to sustain boost frequencies above 2100 megahertz, you either need water cooling or you need to get real lucky with the silicon lottery which is what I've encountered here as we've achieved these boost figures with just air cooling. The other thing I wanted to point out was that the boost behavior seen here is basically what we have come to expect from these ampere based graphics cards. The 3080 and 2080 Super both exhibited the same kind of behavior both of which boosted well above their advertised specs. It's just the way that Nvidia GPU boost works where even though manufacturers will state a rather conservative figure the cards will usually boost well above that given the power and thermal headroom available to them and most AIB models with the better coolers will easily boost close to 2 GHz on their own. Moving on to thermals, and for this test, I decided to stress the cards using TimeSpy Extreme second benchmark on loop for about an hour. Here, the MSI RTX 3060 Ti performs quite good. For the stock configuration, it maintained an average GPU core temperature of just 65 degrees Celsius, while peaking at 68 degrees Celsius. Then, when overclocked, there's hardly a difference, only a mere 1 degree increase to the average GPU temperature, while the peak temp remained the same. From the results, we can see excellent thermal performance from this cooler. It really is an effective design at being able to keep the GPU cool. Those figures under a gaming load are exactly where I'd like to see them for an air cooler of this caliber. This will allow the GPU to comfortably boost its core frequency and sustain a fairly high boost clock as this was evident by the GPU frequency behavior we saw earlier, which should result in higher performance. We have MSI's excellent Trifrozer 2 design to thank for that. Up next, we're going to be taking a look at some GPU synthetic benchmarks. The first application on our list is 3 Mark's Firestrike Ultra. This is a heavy graphics benchmark which utilizes the DirectX 11 API at 4K. When looking at the graphics scores, the 3060 Ti manages to attain 7,537, and that is quite good as it's about 11% faster than the 2080 Super, which gets 6,805. For our next test, we have Time Spy Extreme, a benchmark similar to the Firestrike benchmark, but this one utilizes the DirectX 12 API. API. Here the 3060 Ti is about 12% faster than the 2080 Super, scoring 6117. Definitely not bad for a mid-range GPU, beating out the second best GPU in the previous generation Turing lineup. Next up, we have Unigen Superposition, and here the margins aren't as big as what we saw from 3D Marks benchmarks, and the 3060 Ti still beats the 2080 Super, though it's only a 4% difference. Now it's time for a couple of real-world tests, and for our first test we have Blender, which is a very popular open-source 3D application used by content creators for producing work in areas such as 3D modeling, animation, simulations, and more. Blender can take advantage of NVIDIA's CUDA platform to leverage these graphics cards to accelerate rendering. We're using the Classroom benchmark here, and as you guys can see, Blender absolutely loves NVIDIA's Ampere architecture. In my previous review, the RTX 3080 absolutely demolished the RTX 2080 Super, offering over double the performance, and while the 3060 Ti isn't as fast, of course, we're still seeing a rather large difference between it and the 2080 Super, where the 3060 Ti finished the render 
under in 100 seconds, and the 2080 Super takes 162 seconds. That is quite an astonishing result for this mid-range graphics card. Any viewers watching this who use Blender but don't want to necessarily shell out hundreds of dollars for a good GPU, well, it looks like the 3060 Ti seems like an excellent budget option. I'm quite impressed with Ampere's performance in this application. Next up, we have V-Ray, a computer-generated imagery rendering software developed by Bulgarian Chaos Group. It's a great piece of 3D technology that can be implemented within widely used programs throughout the animation and modeling industry. The V-Ray benchmark was done using only the GPU, and here the program measures how long it will take your hardware to render the scene, and this is done by measuring the amount of empaths. Here we can see the RTX 3060 Ti sitting in between the 3080 and 2080 Super, while being close to the former. The 3060 Ti in this benchmark is a whopping 62% faster than the 2080 Super, another application which shows us some impressive gains for this mid-range option. And I guess it also just goes to show the huge advancements NVIDIA has made with the Ampere architecture when it comes to raw compute performance. If anything, they're looking like a great series of GPUs for content creators. Alright, now that we've gotten those 3D synthetics and rendering benchmarks out of the way, it's time we looked at some gaming performance. So starting with our gaming benchmarks, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a beautiful third-person action-adventure title. Please note, all the gaming benchmarks were tested at 3 resolutions, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. I decided to test 3 resolutions as opposed to just 1440p and 4K like in my last review because I know that gamers who are looking to buy a mid-range graphics card such as this one will be mostly playing at lower resolutions like 1080p and 1440p, while occasionally trying some games at 4K as they likely don't have an expensive 4K monitor or TV and probably have a cheaper 1080p and 1440p panel. This should give you guys a broader insight on how this card performs across the three resolutions. As for settings, most games were tested with their highest presets available with post-processing features like motion blur turned off for obvious reasons. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, we're seeing some pretty strong performance where it averages 155 FPS and gets 113 for the 1% lows. Coming out just slightly ahead of the 2080 Super. At 1440p, we can see a similar story where the 3060 Ti just edges out the 2080 Super by a 5% margin for the average frame rate, and that margin is also bigger for the 1% lows at 9%. Then at 4K, we see both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super offer practically the same performance with the 3080 sitting proudly on a totally different level. But still, for the 3060 Ti offering like-for-like -like performance against the previous gen 2080 Super is impressive to see. Also note, I am going to be going a bit quicker here when going through these gaming benchmarks, as there are three resolutions now, so there's more data to cover, and my last review, I felt like I spent way too much time rambling on about performance. Next up, we have Hitman 2, and at 1080p, we're effectively running into a CPU bottleneck, as all three GPUs are practically offering the same level of performance. At 1440p, and we can still actually see the 3080 get CPU bottlenecked, as both it and the 3060 Ti are still neck and neck, with the 2080 Super starting to trail behind them. Then, when we shift our focus to 4K, we're now completely GPU bound, as the 3080 is 54% faster than the 3060 Ti, but the 3060 Ti is also slightly slower than the 2080 Super when comparing the average frame rates, a difference of 5%, although that's nothing noticeable. Far Cry New Dawn is next, and at 1080p and 1440p, we're again running into a similar situation as we did with Hitman 2. All three GPUs at these lower resolutions are showing the same level of performance because of a CPU bottleneck. With that said though, performance seen here at these resolutions from the 3060 Ti is pretty decent. You can expect a pretty smooth experience. At 4K, when we're fully GPU bound, again is where we see the margins widen. Here the 3060 Ti and the 2080 Super are again tied with respect to performance, so another good showing for the mid-range Ampere GPU. For our next title, we have the Division 2, and this is a title that is more GPU bound, as at 1080p we can still see a major difference between the 3080 and 3060 Ti. The 3060 Ti at 1080p gets 113 FPS average, and the 2080 Super gets 110 with the same 1% low figures. At 1440p, the 2080 Super is ahead by 8% when compared to the 3060 Ti, but still both GPU GPUs show good figures here. Although both GPUs are quite a bit slower than the 3080, which is enjoying a 68% lead over the 3060 Ti. Add 4K and we see a similar story where both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super are delivering virtually the same experience, but it wouldn't be all that great with the average FPS figures in the mid 40s. Here the 3060 Ti is significantly slower than the flagship RTX 3080. I always like to include a racing title in my benchmark suite, so up next we'll take a look at Forza Horizon 4. This is another title that's showing us a CP 
CPU bottleneck, as at 1080p, here we can see the 3060 Ti matching the RTX 3080, while also being 6% faster than the 2080 Super. Didn't imagine Forza Horizon 4 to be so CPU bound, but I guess this was only realized once faster GPUs like the 3080 came out. With an average FPS of 164, that's going to allow the user to enjoy this title with spectacular performance. Even at 1440p, performance doesn't drop by much, and you're still going to attain excellent performance. Bumping up the resolution of 1440p, we can see the margins between the GPUs widen a bit, with the 3060 trailing the 3080 by 7%, but leads the 2080 Super by a 6% margin. Then at 4K, we can see the 3060 Ti and the 2080 Super offering practically the same performance, with both of them being significantly behind the 3080 at this GPU-bound resolution. Still, the average is around 100 FPS. That's excellent, and you need not worry about bad performance, even at this demanding resolution. Gears of War 5 is the next title on our list, another one of Microsoft's beloved IPs, and one of my personal favorites. At 1080p, we see the 3060 Ti matching the 3080 again at this CPU button resolution, with the 2080 Super trailing it by a 6% margin. Then at 1440p, we can see how both the 2080 Super and 3060 Ti are neck and neck, offering the same performance. The figures here are pretty good though, and the 3060 Ti will be great for high refresh gaming experience in this title. At 4K, the 3060 Ti is now losing to the 2080 Super, just shy of that 60 FPS mark, averaging 56 FPS and gets 46 for the 1% lows. Still, as long as you make a couple tweaks here and there in the settings menu, you'd be able to obtain a pretty good smooth experience with the 3060 Ti in this title at 4K, and this is excellent for a mid-range GPU. It just goes to show you that it's versatile, and being able to game at all three resolutions, not just 1080p and 1440p, but playable at 4K with ultra settings is a great showing. Horizon Zero Dawn, a Sony exclusive brought over to the PC with much anticipation due to it being considered a phenomenal game. The port, however, didn't get the best treatment, and there were quite a lot of bugs and issues with this game at launch, but have been resolved through patches. At 1080p, we can see the 3060 Ti get 109 FPS average, a 9% increase over the 2080 Super. Not bad. Then at 1440p, we see the 3060 Ti start to widen the gap a bit when compared to the 2080 Super. Here, the mid-range Ampere GPU enjoys a 16% lead over the previous gen high-end GPU. At 4K, the 2080 Super regains a bit of ground, but the 3060 Ti is still ahead by 13%, though both GPUs would be offering passable performance, and it's the 3080 which would offer the desired performance at this resolution. Borderlands 3 is the next game on our list, and this is a title that also shows performance scaling for the GPU, as at 1080p, the 3060 Ti is 40% slower when compared to the 3080, but is 8% faster when compared to the 2080 Super. Although what's interesting to note is the significantly better 1% low results from the older Turing GPU when compared to the newer Ampere GPUs. At 1440p, the 3080 is still way ahead of the pack, where as the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super are basically neck and neck when it comes to the averages, with the 3060 Ti offering slightly better 1% lows, but you guys can see that at this resolution, both GPUs are just slightly above that 60 FPS mark, still doing decent. So at 4K, we see both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super struggling to get acceptable performance at 39 FPS average, with the 3060 Ti offering slightly better 1% lows, and it's the 3080 which will offer an acceptable, smooth performance here at this resolution. Alright, the next few titles you will see are new additions to my benchmark suite. I thought I'd finally update the list with recent titles. Starting us off is Watch Dogs Legion, and this game is quite demanding, as at 1080p, we can see the 3080 only averaged 96 FPS average and 70 for the 1% lows. Meanwhile, the 3060 Ti shows decent performance relative to that at 77 FPS average, which is 17% faster than the 2080 Super. At 1440p, the 3060 Ti maintains its lead over the 2080 Super. In fact, the margin is a bit bigger now at 20%, and we see a similar margin for the 1% lows, though it's interesting to see how the 3080 barely lost performance from its 1080p results, implying that it was being held back by the CPU. Can't wait to get this test bench set up with my 5900X. Then at 4K, we see quite the dramatic drop for all three GPUs. The 3080 here shows passable performance, meanwhile both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super are showing similar performance, but their experience would be more in line with what you'd expect from a console. Next up, we have another recently released Ubisoft title, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and the behavior seen here at all three resolutions for the GPUs is similar to what we saw from Watch Dogs Legion. At 1080p, the 3060 Ti attains an average of 76 FPS and 58 for the 1% lows, and when comparing that to the 2080 Super, it is higher performance, however, it is closer to the 3060 Ti than we saw in Watch Dogs. At 1440p, the 3060 Ti is still ahead by an 11% margin, but both GPUs are still able to offer decent performance at this resolution. 
Then at 4K is where we see some pretty large performance drops. The 3060 Ti attains an average of 41 FPS and gets 33 for the 1% lows, which isn't terrible. That's still passable for playable, but it wouldn't be all that smooth either. Moving on, and we'll be taking a look at Remedy Games Control. At 1440p, we can see all three GPUs performing above 100 FPS for the averages, with the 3080 way up there. Here, the 3060 Ti still gets 111 FPS for the average and 81 FPS for the 1% lows. Not bad, you'd have a really good smooth experience. At 1440p and both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super offering very similar performance and they are still able to offer the user a decently smooth experience. Then at 4K is where we see a dramatic performance drop on both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super, where they're again still offering similar performance but with the averages in the mid 30s and 1% lows in the 20s. I wouldn't really recommend playing with them at this resolution. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the next game on our list. At 1080p, the 2080 Super just barely edges out the 3060 Ti. Might as well call that a tie. Both GPUs offering similar performance as you'd be able to get a pretty smooth experience out of them. At 1440p, performance for both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super is identical, however, they're still very much playable and experience overall would be smooth. At 4K, both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super are offering virtually the same performance, though with these kinds of figures, they're just okay at this demanding resolution. The last Last game on our list is Death Stranding, and this is a very well optimized title where all three GPUs at 1080p are able to attain averages well above 100 FPS, with the 3060 Ti getting 146 average and the 2080 Super slightly ahead at 152, although with averages that high you probably won't be able to tell the difference. Once we bump up the resolution to 1440p, there is a considerable drop in performance, but both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super are still above 100 FPS and are basically tied. With similar 1% low figures, you'd still be able to attain a very very smooth gameplay experience. Then at 4K, the 3060 Ti is just slightly ahead of the 2080 Super, but with averages in the 60s, you're still getting a good experience and the game is very much playable even at this demanding resolution, so an excellent showing for the 3060 Ti. Alright, now that we've gone over all the gaming benchmarks, it's time we looked at the 13 game averages. Once you see these results, they shouldn't come as a surprise. What we see here is that regardless of the resolutions, whether that's 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, the 3060 Ti just barely edges out the 2080 Super at the lower resolutions and is tied with it at the higher demanding 4K resolution. Definitely not a bad showing for this new mid-range Ampere-based GPU that's supposed to be targeting the 400 US dollar price point. Also from the results, you guys can see the 3060 Ti is actually a pretty versatile graphics card. Where it truly shines is at lower resolutions like 1080p and 1440p. As you guys can see, the 3080 at 1080p is only about 19% faster than the 3060 Ti, as we are more CPU limited here. I mean, we even saw games that show the 3060 Ti tying the more expensive flagship graphics card because of a CPU bottleneck. And the truth is, while reviewers will test these GPUs with the fastest gaming processors, not everyone is rocking a 5th gen Ryzen CPU or a new i9 or i7 that's highly overclocked to like 5 plus gigahertz, so they'll be mostly CPU bottlenecked anyways, especially buyers in this segment who aren't dropping more than $300 or $400 for their CPU. Even at 1440p, the margin between the 3080 and 3060 Ti is just 35%, and this is why I said in my 3080 review, I mainly recommended it as a 4K gaming graphics card, as at 4K we can see a much larger 56% margin over the 3060 Ti. With that said, the performance at 1080p and 1440p for the 3060 Ti is excellent. If you're a gamer who's looking to play a lot of eSport titles, you have a high refresh rate 144 its rate monitor, then the 3060 Ti is looking like a great bang for the buck option. Even at 1440p, the 3060 Ti's worst performance showcase was Watch Dogs where it attained 60 FPS average, but majority of the games showed the 3060 Ti offering performance well above that. Now the next thing I wanted to talk about was overclocking performance. As you guys saw with my frequency behavior graph in the beginning of the video, the 3060 Ti overclocked really well on air, maintaining above 2100 megahertz for the most part and got an additional 1000 megahertz boost for the memory effectively running at 16 gigabits per second. So how does that increase translate in terms of a performance increase? Well, in the TimeSpy Extreme benchmark, we can see the graphics score increase 7% over the stock score. Not not bad, but then again, this is a 3D synthetic, which might not reflect a real-world scenario. So speaking of a real-world scenario, let's take a look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p, and here we can see an increase of 7% to the average FPS, and 6% for the 1% lows in this title, which is actually pretty good and is considerably higher than what we saw with the 3080's overclocking performance. And that's the same performance increase we saw in Time Spy, so that's pretty good. Another title we'll take a look at is Gears 5 at 1440p, and here the overclocked 3060 Ti is 11% faster than the stock 
configuration where it was tied with the 2080 Super and now is quite a bit ahead of it. That's actually pretty good because with the 3080 and 2080 Super, the overclock configurations barely impacted performance in a noticeable way. Whereas the 3060 Ti does see a better performance bump. It's nothing earth shattering, but it's still free performance. Only it took me a few minutes to set up an MSI Afterburner, so I'm not complaining. All right, now I wanted to talk about RTX performance. This is a ray tracing capable GPU after all, and with all the hype surrounding ray tracing and Ampere's improved second gen RT and third gen tensor cores, it's worth checking out and seeing how it compares against the older high end Turing GPU. To start off, we've got 3D Mark Port Royal, a 3D synthetic benchmark that makes use of Microsoft's DirectX ray tracing. Here the RTX 3060 Ti actually gets a slightly lower score than the 2080 Super, where the latter is ahead by a mere 1%, so it's not a huge deal, it's essentially the same level of performance. For our first game we've got Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and we're going to be taking a look at the 4K data, and even though the 3060 Ti is more geared towards 1080p and 1440p resolutions, what we're trying to see here are the performance impacts rather than the overall performance, and I also want to alleviate any other system bottlenecks by playing at this demanding resolution and be primarily GPU bound for this test. With DLSS, the 2080 Super pulls just slightly ahead of the 3060 Ti, though it's not by much. Not really noticeable, so you can pretty much call that a tie. Then with ray tracing enabled, we see a large 61% drop on the 2080 Super, whereas the 3060 Ti is a little less severe at 54%. And if you're wondering what kind of impact the other Ampere based GPU is going through, well the performance impacts there are also similar. Once we combine ray tracing and DLSS together, you guys can see it does help bump up performance for both the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super to a much more playable state, but the experience here wouldn't be all that smooth, kind of similar to what you'd expect on a console. But that's not the focus here, what we wanted to see was how performance was impacted on the RTX 3060, and I'll be showing you guys two more games, Control and Watch Dogs Legion which also support ray tracing in NVIDIA's DLSS, but the results don't need any further explaining. The figures seen here from the 3060 Ti when compared to the 2080 Super between the two GPUs is very similar. It's not like the newer 3060 Ti does considerably better with ray tracing enabled or DLSS enabled, which is a bit disappointing to see considering we are talking about faster improved ray tracing and tensor hardware, though this was already something I discovered when I compared the 3080 and 20 Super in a previous video with more games to see the impacts of RTX on. So I can't say I'm surprised at all. We saw the 3060 Ti and 2080 Super offering similar performance figures when it came to raw traditional rasterization performance, and now we can see that with ray tracing and DLSS, the story is the same with both GPUs neck and neck. Also, since these were 4K benchmarks and most people will be playing at 1080p or 1440p, the RTX 3060 Ti will be able to perform much better at those resolutions with ray tracing enabled. You'll finally be able to get playable frame rates from a mid-range graphics card with RTX on, and that's fantastic, whereas before mid-range options struggled even at lower resolutions. No more having to sacrifice the resolution or turning down other settings to compensate for ray tracing performance. Moving on, we'll be taking a look at power consumption. Power consumption was tested using Time Spy Extreme's second graphics test for one hour. To nobody's surprise, the RTX 3060 consumes less power than both the 3080 and 2080 Super. Looking at the stock configuration of the 3060 Ti shows us that it consumes about 240 watts on average and peaked at 250 watts which is the power limit of this card. Interestingly, when the 3060 Ti is overclocked, power consumption was barely affected as the GPU was already pushed to the limit and so that's why you only see an increase of just 2 watts to the average as now the GPU is more frequently running into its power limit. But damn, 250 watts on a mid-range card, you can actually see that it's not that much more efficient than a previous generation Turing GPU. This is actually pretty hilarious because when you look at the big picture, the mid-range GPUs are now more expensive when compared to the previous generation cards in the same segment, and they're also a lot more uh, power hungry, which means the user might have to upgrade their power supply with a more higher wattage or higher and higher quality power supply, bringing the overall cost considerably higher. I remember back when the 1060 came out, you could throw that card in a pre-built office machine with a crappy PSU, and it would still work for the most part considering how power efficient it was. Since we're on the topic of power consumption, in the near future, I will be making a video where I explore undervolting these Ampere GPUs for some efficiency gains. So so stay tuned for that. Okay, so now I guess it's time to give my conclusive thoughts about the RTX 3060 Ti. The MSI Gaming X Trio model is built pretty well, looks attractive, runs very quiet under load, and the thermals are also excellent. This particular model was also overclocked nicely too, your mileage may vary on that though. Overall, it's a good mid-range GPU. I was happy to see that the card was able to match or slightly beat out the previous generation high-end RTX 2080 Super, though do keep in mind that the RTX 20 series wasn't anything spectacular to begin with, so it shouldn't have been that difficult for newer GPUs to match the performance. I even said this in my 2080 Super review last year when I saw it wasn't that much faster than my 1080 Ti, and that's a GPU from early 2017, so that says a lot. 
Regardless, I was happy to see that the main objective was fulfilled here, which is for mid-range cards to bring previous high-end performance down to lower segments, being able to deliver high-end or previous-gen flagship performance to the masses at lower prices. That is, if you can actually find this card at MSRP, or at least close to MSRP. You see, with the low supply of stock and crazy high demand, this is driving prices higher than where they should be. One thing is for sure, this entire industry is trending towards increased prices, and I don't like it. Where now an X60 class card is supposed to be priced at 400 US dollars, which which already sounds kind of ludicrous when you think about it, considering the GTX 1060 could be had for around 250 US dollars when it came out. But $400 is if you're lucky, and with partner models adding a bit of a premium, prices will most definitely be higher than that. MSI have told me they have valued this card at 619 Canadian dollars, which at the time of making this video roughly converts to about 476 US dollars, which is quite a bit higher than that $400 MSRP, and that's not too far away from lower end RTX 3070 models, which will no doubt be a good deal faster. Therefore, it does make recommending the 3060 Ti a bit tougher. I mean, it's better than what the 2080 Super used to go for last year for around 7 to 800 US dollars or 1000 Canadian, but then again, it was already quite overpriced to begin with. I don't know, I feel like computer components are following that same smartphone trend where once you could find a flagship device for like six or seven hundred dollars, and now you're looking at well over a thousand dollars, and now mid-range or budget options are being priced at those old flagship six hundred, seven hundred dollar prices. I just never thought I'd seen X60 class card be this expensive, but this is the reality of the market, so what can you do? But if you are able to find the RTX 3060 Ti for four hundred dollars or close to that, then I'll say it's a pretty decent deal. You're getting excellent 1080p and 1440p performance in some games. The GPU is capable of delivering a smooth experience at 4K. Before the RTX 3060 was released, I was using my RTX 2080 Super with my 4K OLED TV, and for the most part, it was able to do a decent job in a considerable amount of games. I just had to spend like maybe 5-10 minutes kind of tweaking settings here and there, and it did give a deliverable and acceptable experience. Seeing as how the 3060 Ti is the same, if not better, then it's also a pretty viable option. Also, considering this is a mid-range GPU and has a smaller die size than, say, a flagship GPU, it should also be easier for NVIDIA to manufacture, making it easier to find, so we hopefully shouldn't run into too much stock issues and supply issues and with price hikes. So the RTX 3060 Ti does get my recommendation and I believe it's a decent mid-range graphics card in this current state of the market that PC gamers will probably have been waiting for, that is if you can find it at MSRP. I hope you guys found this video to be informative and helpful. Let me know your thoughts down below. Check out the video description on ways to support the channel and for my other videos. If you guys are interested in more content like this then make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you guys in the next one.